Tom, let's apply common sense to one of the festivals of democracy, the Democratic National Convention. First Lady Michelle Obama. She begins by describing her father and Barack Obama's grandmother as decent people, hardworking people who sacrificed for her families. And then she says this. So when it, when it comes to rebuilding our economy, Barack is thinking about folks like my dad and like his grandmother. He's thinking about the pride that comes from a hard day's work. That's why he signed the Lilly Led Better Fair Pay Act to help women get equal pay for equal work. That's why he cut taxes for working families and small businesses and fought to get the auto industry back on its feet. That's how he brought our economy from the brink of collapse to creating jobs again, jobs you can raise a family on, good jobs, right here in the United States of America. President Obama is giving us, quote, jobs you can raise a family on. Tom? You know, it's, it's, it's like someone once said, it's like, it's like being a mosquito at a nudist colony. You don't know where to start. <laughs> I mean, we're not going to be in the air long enough for me to, to, to dissect all the falsehoods that this woman has put into those few words. Give us uh, one. Okay, the jobs that you can raise a family on. The new jobs that are being created are disproportionately very low-income jobs. So uh, I don't know uh, how, how you're going to be raising a family on uh, minimum wage type jobs or uh, flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. Uh, the other thing is that... What is implicit in all of this is that the economy has no recuperative powers of its own, that all the benefits, all whatever recovery there have, have been, has been due to Barack Obama. It's like that, the scene of Genesis where he's breathing life into the clay of the economy. That, that's it. That's it. Now, anyone who studied history knows that for the first 150 years of this country, the federal government did not intervene when the economy turned down. And all that time, the downturns all corrected themselves. One of the, one of the, most, one of the most classic examples was on the Warren G. Harding. Uh, when he, his first year in office, he found the unemployment rate at 11.7%. He did absolutely nothing. And he did not spend more government money. He cut back government spending. Uh, the Federal Reserve had the uh, interest rates up at 6 or 7%, not down at 1% where they are, are now. Uh, the next year, unemployment was at 6.7%. The year after that, it was 2.4%. So the economy has recuperative powers. I mean, employers have an incentive to hire people. Workers have an incentive to get jobs. Lenders so, uh, have incentives to lend. Is it your they don't need somebody in Washington trying to micromanage all of this. Your argument is not only weak form of the argument. Barack, we don't need Barack Obama to breathe life into the economy right. because it'll recover on its own sooner or later. If strong, Barack Obama stays out of the way. That's what I'm saying. The strong form of the argument is Barack Obama's actually been holding it down. No question. I mean, uh, th there's never been a, 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 a recovery other than that of the Great Depression of the 1930s that took so long. Uh, under Ronald Reagan, Reagan in the, in the early years got up to 9.7% uh, annual unemployment. Uh, he did absolutely nothing. The media went crazy. The unemployment came down, and it kept right on coming down. Right. All right. So common sense, use your head. One common sense question is, what went wrong? How did we get into this mess in the first place? And Bill Clinton, once again at the Democratic National Convention, explained the answer. Yes. In Tampa, the Republican argument against the president re-election was actually pretty simple, pretty snappy. It went something like this. We left him a total mess. He hadn't cleaned it up fast enough, so fire him and put us back in. <laughs> the Republicans created the mess. This shows that Clinton is truly a masterful politician. And to be a masterful politician, you have to have a lot of brass. And it takes an incredible amount of brass for Bill Clinton who was, the, who was the, the biggest factor in creating the housing boom that led to the bust that brought down the whole economy. Uh, it was during the Clinton administration that the federal government forced lenders to change their lending standards, which had been in place for decades and had made real estate one of the safest investments around. Bring those standards down in order that they can get the numbers that they want for low-income, minority, et cetera, uh, mortgage uh, applicants. 
Barney Frank, the ranking Democrat on the House committee that oversaw Freddie, May and Fannie May, uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, said, quote, I'm willing to roll the dice yes. on Freddie and Fannie, meaning... He would, he would take, he'd be willing to take the chance that the standards were being brought down too low. More than that, uh, Attorney General Janet Reno under, the, under Clinton uh, threatened lenders with legal, with legal action from the Justice Department if their numbers uh, in terms of groups and, and income levels of people who were approved didn't fit her preconceptions. HUD under, under Clinton uh, took, made loss, lawsuits against uh, lenders uh, charging them with racial discrimination based solely upon statistics. So, so Tom, give me for the layman a three-sentence summary, a t sound bite kind of summary of what caused the mess we're in. It was not a failure of the market. It was a failure of... The government forcing people to lower, lower the in, uh, lending standards that had existed for years uh, and they say, well, the problem was blamed on greed. You don't satisfy greed by lending to people who can't pay you back. All right. Uh, you, assist, you insist once again that if we base this election on the facts, the Obama administration would be, quote, doomed. But listen to President Obama himself. Last clip from the Democratic National Convention. If you believe that new plants and factories can dot our landscape, that new energy can power our future, that new schools can provide ladders of opportunity to this nation of dreamers. If you believe in a country where everyone gets a fair shot and everyone does their fair share and everyone plays by the same rules, then I need you to vote this November. All right, new plants and factories, new energy, new schools, and a fair shot. What's wrong with that? <laughs> I, I, I wonder if the fair shot includes the taxpayers, but uh, we've had we've had things we've had factories before there was Barack Obama. On, uh, hard as it, that is to believe, you know, and uh, we we've had less of it since he came in. Okay, Tom. So let's let me ask this question, which is politically incorrect, which makes it all the more important to ask. Some component of the voting public voted for him last time around as an act of national expiation yeah. because it, they felt, and I, I frankly, I, can, I could feel it myself. We were all proud, that even those of us who supported the opponent, we all felt proud the following day that the United States of America, uh, the Constitution takes slavery into account, the Civil War, but finally we have a black man as president of the United States. All right, that's perfectly understandable. We, under, we know that took place. Four years later, what about the argument that it is so important for him to get this right, so important as, as a continuation of this national act of expiation and healing and so forth, that in some way it's only right to give him, frankly, more slack than you might... Affirmative action for presidents. Well, there you go. I suppose that's what it amounts to. I guess you don't buy that one. Well, when you realize that the President of the United States has the lives of 300 million people in his hands... He has the future of Western civilization in his hands. Uh, uh, he has the freedom that has been inherited over the centuries in his hands, and he's already starting to dismantle that. Uh, I really don't think this is a question of any individual, whoever's in the White House, being cut in the slack. The last thing you need to do is cut slack to people who have power over 300 million other people. All right. Segment cut two. some slack for those 300 million people. 